All right, how's it going, everybody? Uh, today I'm here with a good friend, uh, Mania, who's uh, actually running a school, Mokotel uh, Jiu Jitsu in Sudan. Um, we're currently filming from Dakar, you know, this being the Dakar Senegal series uh, of the podcast. Started out with Professor uh, Kelly the other day, um, uh, brought Mo on to talk about, you know, the significance of being here for this trip, getting promoted to black belt two days ago, the 11th black belt um, under a COA team, and his journey uh, to take jujitsu uh, back to Sudan. Uh, so if you could start now, just kind of talk about um, how you started training jujitsu. Like what, what drew you into training jujitsu? Well, um, first of all, thanks for having me. You know, it's been no, a pleasure I'm, kicking it with yeah, you. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And uh, I started jujitsu about introduced to it by 2009. Okay. You know, most of everyone else, kind of same goal, what was MMA at the time. You know, so as soon as I walked in, they were like, you know, you got to do your striking, your grappling. Uh, I wasn't really into it, so I kind of focused on Muay Thai. But by 2011, yeah. I just, you know, fell in love with it, got more hooked. And uh, since like then, everybody. Just, yeah. yeah, since then, that was it. Kind of, I think it was like my first, uh, I did an in-house tournament, like four months after trading. Oh, wow. Yeah, and then that feeling of competition and, and just that energy of everyone being there. Yeah. And then I just was like, yeah, I need to improve in this. I need to improve in that to keep growing. And then that was the rest has been history. Okay. And yeah, you started out training in, uh, in D.C. area, right? Yeah. In Washington, D.C. Yeah. area, right? So first in 2009, I was a I was out in Team Lloyd Irvin, mm -hmm. on, uh, Lloyd Irvin Academy. And uh, it was kind of far, you know, through the whole Beltway. You know, I was in the D.C. area, so yeah. I could get on, like the whole 495 to get out there. Um, so I stopped maybe like nine months, and then in 2010, I found a gym, uh, Beta Academy, mm -hmm. under Professor Nakapon, and uh, that was much closer to my house. Okay. And the energy, the vibe, it was just great, and then I just stuck there for about five years. Yeah, so, so talk about like, uh, some people don't compete at all, so it sounded like you were, you were into it, you know, competing from the jump, right? Some people yeah. go years without competing, but you were ready from the jump, right? Yeah, I, I was, I, that's what I was really attracted to for the, from, since I was young. Okay. I just wanted to compete. Like, I don't know, I had something to prove, I guess, to yeah. myself. But I like that, that, that feeling of, you know, conquering a little bit, especially when I was young. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, it, was, it, was a, it was a good feeling that jiu-jitsu, you can compete from a very early age inside of like the art when you're still young in the art. Yeah. And you are competing exactly with the group, your category, you know, belt level, weight class, age, mm -hmm. you know, the novice, beginners, you know, all that. So it was really cool to kind of see that you could be good at your group level, you know? Yeah. And that motivated you to keep pushing and try to go to the next group. So it's been a good journey. That's you know? awesome, man. That's awesome. Can you share your story about, uh, you know, um, being from Sudan, being in the States, kind of going back and forth, and then now, you know, have, having a school primarily in, in Sudan, right. you know, mainly responsible for all of, you know, MMA, Jiu-Jitsu, and, and Sudan, yeah. man, so. Um, it, it's been interesting because, um, it wasn't really about martial arts, but around 2014, I decided, uh, uh, by then it was close to 10 years being in America. I, did, I wanted to go back. I wanted to, um, I just wanted to have this African lifestyle a little bit again. Yeah. I was tired of just waking up every day super early, going to work yeah. in that fashion, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, it was just draining a little bit. Want, wanting to have the uh, the African lifestyle coming back yeah, to us. Yeah, I just wanted to come back. Yeah. Actually, it wasn't really uh, just about Africa, but you know, I just I just wanted a slower pace. Yeah. You know, working, training, going to college at the same time. It was just like a a loop I was doing for ten years. Yeah. It was just really draining. I just wanted to, a little better. So I planned to move back for a little bit, and then I was going to try to move like somewhere similar, which was like UAE, the Gulf area, mm -hmm. the Middle East. Yeah. You know, jobs are available, nice jobs, and also jujitsu and MMA is growing fast. So that was the plan. So I moved to Sudan, and then I had, I gave myself like six months there. And then uh, I started looking for gyms to train, and I was finding here and there some Muay Thai areas that were very kind of weak at the time. Yeah. So I uh, decided to train on my own. And then more people were just showing up. We were training at a park. And then I started to do some people to jiu-jitsu. We had uh, three days a week. We had a, a wrestling day, a jiu-jitsu day, and a Muay Thai day. And it was just out on the grass. And that was for like four months. And within four months, I had like 15 students who were like serious. Who were dedicated students. Dedicated. Yeah. And we were just out in the park. It was for free. 
That's and, awesome. Uh, it was really nice, and then that just put the idea that hey, I can't just walk away from these people, and uh, we just got a small area rented out, and eighty percent of the construction we did ourselves. Okay, wow. Well, so you, did and, you uh, uh, do a construction like construct a building yeah, in the ground up? Wow. Up to now, uh, this is the third location. Okay. Since I've opened, we opened in two thousand fifteen. Okay. Nice. So, uh, about seven and a half years now. Nice, nice. Yeah, so this is the third location. This third location where we are now, we I built most of it, yes. Okay. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's just every time I gave myself like, okay, one more year, we'll see how these people go and then, you know, I'll go back to, you know, some office job, I guess, we'll get back to some, <laughs> it's another country, and then I can't. You yeah. Know, something happens yeah. and yeah. you feel like, I don't know. It, it feels like you start setting goals for what you want to do there, yeah. And then you just can't walk away from them. So, and then so the thing is, the goal just keeps going, and it has been a blessing. Like this is the longest thing I've been focused on as one thing. Mm-hmm. I started off so that it was tough running a gym. I had like four other jobs. Was, oh, just uh, to try to maintain. Yeah, yeah. English teacher three times a week at two different schools of so six days a week. Man, Man, I worked a host at a radio station. And trying to go coach on top and of all. And I'm trying to train and come. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I did, I went pro in my MMA, both of my MMA fights under my school. So I was self-taught teaching oh, that's myself, awesome, camping man. with some of my students, you yeah. know. And, uh, you know, I had two MMA fight professionals, one both of them. So it was a good opportunity to, to grow in that. And then when I opened my school, I was still a blue belt. And, uh, Just like Lloyd, right? Lloyd Irvin was blue belt when he first opened. Everybody gave him a hard time. Yeah, yeah. You know, and everyone tell you like you can't do it, or you know, and I understand that 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 concept that the knowledge is not enough. Yeah. You know, but you, you can't just make a flat rule when it comes to these things. Yeah, know? for Especially sure. Especially in countries where they don't, you know, a white belt teaching is better than no one teaching. No, yeah, you know? yeah. Even if you if you had the options between a black belt and a blue belt. Of course, we won't even bring the, the blue belt to the table. Right yeah. Now. But when you have no one, <laughs> I think if someone's teaching you how to shrimp, it's better than that. Yeah. Move, right? Yeah, basically. Yeah. Do you think it was, uh, so here, you know, in Senegal, they have the llama wrestling. Um, is, there, is there a similar culture in Sudan as well, too? Yes, or? we have the culture, but it's not as uh, uh, diverse. It's not as spread as it here is in, in, in Senegal. Oh, okay. So uh-huh. we have a wrestling, it's called the Nuba wrestling. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's very popular. They have stadiums. They have big championships. But they're more popular in the uh, the southern and western parts of the country. Oh, so it's like regional specific. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the culture is common. It's known as Sudanese. Everyone likes it. But no one really gets involved in it except the professionals of it, the tribes yeah. that originally started it. Uh, gotcha. So you, it's, it's rare that you will catch some guys or some young boys on the street who know how to wrestle. Oh, okay. That's almost impossible. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, sadly in Sudan, like, it's been a long time. Uh, they used to tell us, like, in the 60s, where Sudan was, like, really big in boxing and big in sports and basketball. Well, I haven't seen any of that. Yeah, no. <laughs> Not in my generation. <laughs> but people are very far away from sports in general. And fitness, completely opposite yeah. of Senegal. Yeah, it's the opposite. We, we, you know, as we drive around, I see kids on the side of the road yeah, running, yeah. everybody playing, you know, soccer, everyone like they're out and about. Everyone is playing around wrestling. Yeah, yeah. Doing this, even some push ups on the sidewalk yeah. and all that. You would never see that in Sudan, you know? No. Nah. So, no, nah, that's nah. not part of the culture. So it's like the hard thing is, I tell you, we promote an art, we promote a lifestyle, then we introduce them to it, mm. then we teach them. And then we watch them grow and try to hopefully they can even help me out sure. one day in growing and pushing the art forward. So it's, it's, it's a slow base, but we came a long way in the past. When you first started, did you see yourself where you are today with, with three schools uh, in Sudan, like growing population of students? Did you, uh, did you think it would be possible? Or? Yeah, I dream big. Yeah, you know, okay. I, that's I usually that's how I am. I dream big. Okay. You know, and it's still a habit. Uh, my goal. Uh, it's not just in Sudan, but definitely in the region. But you know, it's to it's to turn into like the center I have. We have Mukwadi Mukwadi Training Center, mm-hmm. and you know, kind of the idea is to have something like community centers like we have in America. Yeah, you know, where you know the youth have somewhere to go to, play basketball, the, you know, just boxing. You know how these community centers are in like uh, the neighborhoods. Mm-hmm. That you know, keep them off the street, keep them away from drugs. Doing something, something productive. Something productive. Yeah. So then we don't have any community products, especially for young people like that. Yeah. So, 
I'm a martial artist, so I have to focus on what I'm good at. Right? Yeah. But the idea is not just selling a concept of jujitsu or martial arts, but something to develop the youth. I'm more focused on the community aspect of it, you know, and um, that has been the focus in mm-hmm. the past. And I hope that at least every city or every state in Sudan we can have some type of center where people come together because we teach jiu-jitsu, Muay Thai, kickboxing, normal boxing, mm-hmm. uh, different fitness programs that go on, yeah. kids, adults, women, women only classes. So we try to have it like an area where people come together, it's like program, people hang out, people do different arts at the same time, got things going on. Yeah. So that is my goal, to have more of that around the continent, uh, starting with my country and in the region area, to you know, fulfill these young, young boys and girls, man. They have so much energy, so much talent, and they're held back for, you know, just the idea of making things happen. I yeah. don't think we're missing something in particular, but how to put them in order. You know, they, they, they fill us up since we're young here in Africa that, you know, life is hard, you got to work, you got to feed, you got to do that. So they think everything else on the other is, is kind of not that important. Do you want a more positive uh, aspect or outlook on but life? But yeah, like yeah. if you're not going to work or you're going to school, like anything else you're doing on the side, that's not important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's like for the rich. That's for um, someone who has extra, who sure, will do yeah. jiu-jitsu, who will just do any type of exercise. Yeah, yeah. And that's a that's a wrong like that's message not true. to send. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. You're gonna have more energy the more you you exercise, the more you work out. You're gonna have yeah. more energy to actually go and work and achieve your goals and whatever else you want to do. Yeah. So sending that message, trying to get that message out there and keeping the youth active, I think is really important. In my country, we have a big serious issues of drugs now. Mm-hmm. You know, strong stuff like uh, you know crystal meth stuff like that have entered very recent the past wow. few years. And this is in a population that 80% is unemployed almost every today since like 2019. Almost every one who graduates college doesn't get a job. Uh, the economy's crazy. The, the, yeah. uh, it's nothing, unstable. You know, it's an unstable country right now. So to see that, you know, that's the easy way out. Stay high. Yeah. Um, you know. Uh, and, and, and then we have another thing here in Africa that it's really sad, I find it. The biggest goal and the biggest dream is to make it to Europe. That's to what leave. you talk about. Yeah. Finish college, get myself together. No one is finishing college to get a job. You have to finish college because your parents, you owe them. The pressure. Of, the pressure. Yeah. Here, 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 you don't make decisions <clears> like that. I don't know about Senegal and Sudan. You don't make these. Like You're rare and you're not... Like my type of personality, like I'm, I'm not a good kid coming up. You know, I, mean? I have my own goals. I'm yeah. cool, I'm gonna make them happy. Even though you're more successful than your peers, you know. See, they but, don't, they don't yeah, see yeah, that. Yeah. You know, and my parents weren't that fully supportive. People see them today, and they think, "Wow, like you're that way. You're doing what you love because your parents support you." No, Let's they had opposite. to support. They support me after they knew how serious I was yeah. about my goals and pushing myself so hard towards them. They were against it for many years, or didn't understand it but yeah. when they see how dedicated you are and they see you're starting to succeed they they they, they believe you know after yeah. that like yeah hey, we're going to support him like you know this is something that he saw that we didn't see yeah right? that's awesome man but in sudan that's not how it is well majority of people they don't choose a major they take in college yeah your dad is a doctor he has a dream seeing you with him as a doctor then that's what you're that's it to yeah <laughs> you don't play a huge role in choosing the wife you want, yeah. or the wife choosing her husband. Yeah, you could say that's the person, but if you don't get the final okay from all four, from you know her parents, your parents, and then even sometimes the grandparents, everyone gets involved. Oh man! If you they don't give you the one hundred okay, then it's not your decision. Yeah. So it's it's uh, they they're very depressed in that area, and all they want to do is run away, yeah. and they risk their lives crossing the Sahara Desert crossing the Mediterranean Sea. And we're talking about like, like airboats and some swimming, like they really put their lives on the line to make it to Europe and live illegally homeless, trying to find a job. Just to say they made it yeah. up. Yeah. And for me, this past, we went to the Europeans and in France and we went with legally visas. Everyone is for that and it's like, how did you do it? And of course everyone thinks like, oh, cause this guy's American. He has all the hookups. Like yeah. it's just like, I could walk in and say, I'm American, give these guys visas, right? That's impossible because anytime 
a group gets visas now, any part of Europe, somebody they come back missing someone. Oh wow. Yeah. I'm like the first group that I took a group of jiu-jitsu all the way to France. And they came back. And back in one unit on time with no record, no one getting arrested, nothing. That almost never happened. Wow. We were met at the at the at the embassy by the counselor because yeah. of that. You mentioned you have men and women training together. Um, did you encounter any cultural like hardships or hurdles you had to cross in order to make that happen? Yeah, well, until now, we still, our general classes are separated. Okay. We have men have their own days and women actually have their own days. Okay. Uh, and then I have like an advanced group that kind of trains. I teach, kind of work with both at the same time. They sure. kind of do their own drills at the same time, but I'm like the, the one managing or teaching the class. Um, <clears throat> in the beginning, uh, it was really difficult. It was impossible actually yeah. to, to even teach females, not yeah. even having mixed classes. So I looked for a female trainer for a few years. Of course, I didn't find anyone. Yeah. So I kind of opened the door that if uh, any uh, you know women who are interested in training don't have a problem with the male uh, teaching, you know, we will open registration for that. Mm -hmm. So I started with a small group, me and one of my guys, you know, we demonstrate, we show the technique and move on. But it was very risky, especially at the time. So yeah. it was 2018. <clears throat> it was, uh, you know, even till today, it's, uh, even if it's not the law, the culture won't really accept yeah. it, you know. Yeah. So it was a very temporary thing that I knew. So I spent a few, a few year, uh, less than a year in, on that, or maybe a year. And then um, kind of picked out the girls that were really outstanding, who really wanted to take this to the next level and then I started working with them only. And uh, they went through some of our leadership programs and learned how to be trainers and started assisting in some classes. And then now we have actually an all women's program where these young women who are now even just blue belts, oh, but nice. can run <clears throat> an all fee women's uh, program. And nice. it has been great to be done for the past two years actually doing that. That's awesome. And they would like train with me and then they'll go and teach the basics and foundations to me all. And then are they spread out through all the all the schools or just like one school specifically? Yeah, well, so this is like the main school. It's like okay. one school uh, in Khartoum. Okay. Uh, we have some guys that train outside, but it's not to the level of actually a fully academy. For gotcha. It's more like people get together and train. So uh, in our school, we have three days a week mm -hmm. that are all women. The whole program, the whole menu, like from Muay Thai, the strength oh, and conditioning, uh, the boxing, that's dope. and the Jiu Jitsu. Completely mm -hmm. young girls that run it themselves. Um, even the, the, the building is built in a way that it gives them their full privacy. Nice. Uh, so uh, it has been a very successful program since we have done that. That's good. So a few years ago, you made uh, the trek from Sudan down to, to Kenya to compete. I think you guys met, uh, you know, Coach Kelly out there. Right. Um, huge trip. You want to talk about like what you endured? You know, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a whole YouTube video that talks about the entire journey. But right. can you kind of highlight some of the, the main points of that trip? Yeah. Uh, so we knew like through uh, Lionheart and with Coach Kelly and, and the whole team, the core team out in America that you know, we're working towards having an East African championship. Mm -hmm. So I was part of organizing it, playing a few a role from the early of the year, beginning of the year. And that was exactly the same time that Sudan was going through its civil, uh, uh, through the peaceful demonstrations and, and through that revolutionary age. Mm -hmm. So during that moment, I was helping organize the Nairobi Open while I was participating in all the, uh, you know, peaceful protests and all of whatever was going on. Yeah. Um, so I was supposed to uh, travel myself and I was trying to encourage a few guys to come with me, you know, and it was like a little expensive, this yeah. and that. And then June 3rd, we had, uh, uh, no, um, May 30th, okay. We had, uh, it was like a massacre that happened during the conflict, the sitting was uh, broken up and uh, close to 500 people had been killed. A lot of people were missing mm -hmm. and and a lot of my, my students were present during that, uh, what happened that day, uh, including myself. So, you know, I just, I saw Nairobi Open was less than a month after that. So we kind of looked at it like everybody was at the gym. You could tell people were a little depressed. Yeah. And just it was tough what going on. And I just feel like this was a good opportunity to do something different. And um, kind of canceled my trip uh, by flight. Put the money together. We did a uh, like a GoFundMe on Facebook through Lionheart's page, yeah. 
And um, we even came short on the money to planning, but we decided to do it. So. Go anywhere. Yeah. yeah. So the trip was supposed to take three days. It took six it took, days. Yeah, I remember seeing And seven <laughs> back. And a lot of the story doesn't talk about uh, the return trip, which is harder than going, actually, because the car was like, the van was beat up. I and, saw that, yeah, on the yeah, trip out. Was, yeah. You guys broke down a couple times yeah. going. Yeah. 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 But uh, it, it was... It was um, it was very important that it made a really big difference, I believe. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I got these young men out of certain state. Majority of them have never traveled before. Yeah. Uh, two of them in particular, we have to even speak to their parents to give them, like, you know, the chance yeah. to travel and permission try some to different go. permission. Yeah. You know, so it was it was very uh, different than what um, they go through every day. So yeah. we're glad that uh, we were part of something nice like that and to be with the, uh, you know, and, and after that long trip, six days, they competed at the same day. We got there at uh, yeah. 6 a.m. We competed like around 10 a.m. Yeah. And um, it was just a good, a good experience to, to, to go through hardships mm -hmm. and still feel good about it. Now, that was a cool, I, I remember uh, Coach Kelly sent it to me uh, before coming out here, you know, months ago before this trip. He's like, man, before you go out, you got to watch this, you know, see what Mo and his team went through going from Sudan to Kenya. So, yeah. yeah. Props to you guys for making it. Uh, and there was uh, two athletes had to fly, right? Or was it one yeah. had to fly? Yeah, one had an issue uh, at the border. So we drove close to 24 hours to get to the border. Uh, and then when we got there, uh, he was actually from South Sudan. Oh, okay. So some of the documents, is, is very interesting. Like a lot of the documents are still similar to uh, before separation when Sudan was one country. Mm -hmm. And then a lot of other things that they have an issue with. So we didn't really fully understand. We thought our papers were good. Yeah. But when we got to the border, they just refused. So he had to catch the bus back another 24 hours to get back. And, and then, then try to the fly. The rest of the team kind of worked it out, put money together, and they got yeah. a work flight. That's yeah. awesome, man. That's dope. So I always like to close out uh, my podcast talking about the process. So we'll, let's back up. So two days ago, uh, you know, you got promoted to Black Belt. What, you know, what was the nostalgia of that? You know, coming back to, to Senegal uh, to get promoted, being here with the team, what was like the most memorable part of that? Um, I'm still I'm still kind of like choked up. Like I yeah. really haven't processed that what just happened. Yeah. Uh, you know, 13 years, and you know, especially like I remember it's like yesterday when I was a white belt, that's yeah. all you thought about. Yeah. It was like a dream that you know it could come true, but you had no idea how and you know, it's just something that you just have to believe that it could, but yeah. it was like very, very far, right? And um, to be here now, it's like quite overwhelming. Yeah. Um, but, <clears throat> you know, uh, being honest, the most thing I, my mind started to work on is like, um, you know, what can we do? What, what, how can we improve what we're doing already? Yeah. You know, and uh, this is gonna make a huge difference. Um, especially talking with the more officials, talking with uh, the government, getting them involved in jiu-jitsu. Oh, yeah. Uh, nice. Yeah, so like they say, I could, I, could, I could speak now with a stronger personality. Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> Black belt is telling yeah, me yeah, you know, yeah. that this is proof. This It's yeah. a little different when you're younger and color belt to, to speak on the yeah. name of the whole country, right? So we hope that we could start, you know, little by little, growing into a federation, getting organized and spreading jiu-jitsu and more. Uh, bigger uh, radius around the city and a little bit outside entering the the suburbs and we don't have suburbs but you know the countryside mm -hmm. and eventually even the the other countries around us that have small jiu-jitsu like us that are very kind of coming yeah. up and uh, hopefully we grow I uh, hope with uh, the African jiu-jitsu community in general because they all face the same issues same as uh, us in Sudan here in Senegal. Mm -hmm. They have the same situation in Uganda and Kenya and Tanzania. Yeah. Um, most of these countries are it's just a few gems that are really have the same passion and they, they really haven't done much. They can't. It's really difficult. Mm -hmm. A lot of them suffer from not having black belts as well. Yeah. So hopefully we can have some type of union where we could come up together and look out for each other and help each other with curriculums and championships and you know even promotions. You know, yeah. Kind of in that way. So um it's kind of more work more responsibility but it feels good it feels good that uh, that you can actually now do more yeah yeah honest, especially in africa yeah. and that's really what uh, the black belt means to me right now is achieving that goal that you saw once this is the longest thing i stuck with mm -hmm. uh and achieving and the second thing is just you know that we can do more good hopefully and that's the plan
Yeah, speaking of spreading it across the continent, um, you know, at the tournament a couple of days ago, there's people that travel from Ivory Coast, you know, different countries, different, you know, different parts of Senegal. <clears throat> you know, asked Buba a couple of years ago, he's like, is mainly just focused around the gym, you know, right. but to see more people spread out, you know, there's another spot. They opened another, uh, you know, kids program. We went to, to teach, you know, at yeah, the kids program. Yeah, yeah. That was awesome, yeah. phenomenal to, to see that, mm-hmm. man. Mm-hmm. So now overall, the entire process of your jujitsu journey, uh, what would you say has been the most memorable part or most rewarding part of the journey? Um, rewarding part to me is, is, is the community itself, yeah. you know, to see more people involved in this type of community. Uh, people that carry themselves with confidence and uh, just, just good people that are trying to live life and, and have life in a particular order. Yeah. Um, and to see individuals, for me in particular as a trainer and a, and a school owner, to see individuals that make serious changes in their lives in front of you. Mm-hmm. Um, to me, um, me myself growing up, I had a lot of anger problems, and you know I suffered a lot of depression and stuff. And then usually it comes just for I take things very very serious. Yeah. Uh, even if I'm joking, it's still serious. You're still passionate yeah, about it. About whatever I do. <laughs> yeah. so it could become very stressful if I'm putting the energy in the wrong place. Yeah. Right. So now I got to put it in jujitsu, so I don't have to deal with all that. But so. I, <laughs> I owe it all to, to martial arts in general, uh, that I could put all that energy in a good place. Yeah. And I hope that um, we could do the same thing with as many people as we can, especially in the continent. Uh, we suffer with a lot of issues here in the continent um, regarding, you know, um, most people don't get jobs. Uh, yeah. Most of the people graduate from college, 80% of the Sudan don't work. Um, so uh, I mentioned this before several times that <clears throat> the biggest dream right now on the continent is actually to leave the continent. Yeah. And that's what is being discussed. That's what is being talked about. That is the ultimate, the one who makes it across the Mediterranean Sea into Europe, all illegally, are, you know, the ones who made it. Yeah. And basically they did make it because if you don't die crossing the Sahara and you didn't die dealing with whatever happens in Libya. Yeah. And if you don't. Going yeah, across, across the Mediterranean, the Mediterranean yeah. and then not getting arrested immediately by whatever the country you cross into, yeah. usually Italy. Um, and then you get to Europe and you're probably homeless most of the time. Yeah. It's still, that's the way out. You know, and it's really sad to see how uh, as Africans, we have our standards, how low they've become. Just, yeah. Europe, you know, that, you know, it should be, it should be other ways instead of that. So. Uh, I believe through martial art that myself, that I can make a living off of it. Uh, I, I something that I love the most. Yeah, I don't make a great living, but I'm alive and, yeah. you know, and this is all I do. So I think that's really important to show the youth in particular that you know, there are other ways out mm-hmm. and you can become great at something, something you can be proud of and it will teach you so many skills that you can become successful in any areas, uh, not just in martial art. And I hope that that is what we can leave behind, what we could promote the most here. As a legacy. And, um, yeah, and, yeah, and you know, right away that that you know, younger adults in particular who now they dream how they could leave, that they they're the ones who need to build this continent. Yeah. I mean, if they don't put in the work, or if they don't even have the idea to stay and put some type of work, it'll never. Who's happen. gonna do it? Yeah. You know. Yeah. So we leave it while other people come, big yeah. corporations <laughs> to control everything. Yeah. So, yeah. Hopefully, we'll be part of uh, changing the mindset more important than actually physically training. So with that said, have you uh, maybe encountered some some people, you know, local to Sudan have decided to come back now, now that there's more of a calling uh, for martial arts in in Sudan? Have you seen any? Have you experienced that any? Uh, Coming back, um, a lot of people did come back during Sudan's transition. Um, They lived uh, 30 years with a dictator, so... When that finally chance happened in 2019, yeah. a lot of people decided to come back and, oh, okay. and invest in the country. But sadly, another coup happened in 2021, yeah. so we we're back yeah. to zero. And a lot of people left. And a lot of people wonder why I didn't leave. And that's why, you know, to me, that's why I'm there. Because yeah. of the community, I'm not here for politics yeah, or yeah. whatever. We, I'll be there with the good and the bad. Um, but not regarding martial arts, you didn't see much. But the, the good thing is there are a small amount of people that have been training, that have been taking it serious, and have been quite successful in the past few years. Yeah. Um, especially in MMA, a few fighters. 
So then these guys who were my students once uh, be, have went pro and, nice. you know, and, and have grown and they can start making the little money they can right now. Yeah. In the short time, I think is a, is a huge success. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Well, thanks again for taking the time. I know we had to, uh, you know, endure a lot to get this podcast going, no, um, but it's been awesome to spend this last, yeah, you know, week with you here uh, in Senegal. And, and I hope to, to try to make it down to Sudan one day to train, definitely, definitely. come visit the gym, man. Yeah, we're but, gonna try to organize some maybe yeah. next year. No, for, for you sure. Guys to come up to the east Absol- part of Africa. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. man. And whenever I'm in the states, I'm gonna come see you. Come for sure. Stop by, man. Yeah. Academy, man. Thanks Take again. Care.